This episode is brought to you by the Bell & Blank Center at the University of Iowa at bellandblank.org with programs and resources to support neurodivergent students and their families. Communication can be facilitated through technology in certain ways, but I do think it can also be a huge challenge to figure out how we can not do battle over technology, but actually use it to support communication, to support understanding and relating. Talking to kids, even when it's just small talk, can be uncomfortable. It's a skill that every parent can probably improve, but whether it's what did you have for lunch or something way bigger, the basis of every conversation is trust and rapport. Knowing when is as important as knowing how. There are times to avoid talking altogether. Also, is technology making it harder to talk to kids? Or might there be an opportunity to harness technology to your conversational advantage? Today, Rebecca Rowland, author of The Art of Talking to Children, is here to talk about talking. That's straight ahead on episode 150. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Before our talk with Rebecca, if you're looking for a last-minute holiday gift idea, and really, aren't we all... Let me just suggest our new selection of swag. We have t-shirts, water bottles, tote bags, and more. And we'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy to make your order and get it onto a truck and headed your way before the holidays. Speaking of holidays, we are scheduling our guest lineup for 2023. If you have guest suggestions, there's a place to drop us a note on our website. Just go to neurodiversitypodcast.com. Rebecca Rowland is next. When I found the Neurodiversity Podcast, I was really kind of desperate to learn about myself and understand myself. And understand my kids. And honestly, I wanted to find like a tribe who I could relate to and feel like I fit in. This podcast brings on guests who seem to be moving neurodiversity more into the mainstream. And Emily Kircher Morris is amazing. I feel like she's talking straight to me sometimes. Her knowledge about people who think differently is so refreshing. Everyone's different. And the world needs to understand them. And that's what the Neurodiversity Podcast is doing. Helping them understand us. 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 Today, I'm welcoming Rebecca Rowland to the podcast. Rebecca is a speech pathologist and author of the book, The Art of Talking with Children. So, Rebecca, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, yes. Thanks for having me. So, I'm a mental health counselor, and I specialize working with kids and teens. So, I feel like I have a lot of experience and time that I spend (laughs) talking to kids. But it's interesting because as a parent of three kids, a lot of times I feel guilty that I spend an hour at a time talking to other people's kids, but feel so rushed and sometimes disconnected from my own kids, which I think is just a result of kind of how busy we get in all of our lives. So I'm curious, what are some of your thoughts about the feeling that many parents have that they just don't have enough time to have those real conversations with their kids and the time just kind of slips away? Yes, definitely. I definitely sympathize. So I'm the mom of two kids myself. I have a five-year-old and I just turned 11-year-old. Um, And so we often are really busy ourselves and I'm busy, you know, balancing work and school and for them and everything. Um, I would say, though, that um, it doesn't always take a ton of time. So sometimes we can really take a couple of moments, even a few times a day to check in with kids and build that bond and that connection and even sort of jumpstart conversations we can have later on. So it's not to say we have a full conversation every time. But even to just reflect on something we said before, to think about what we might want to plan for the next day, these kind of check-ins can really help us slow down and be a little bit more self-aware when we feel like we're in that rush. Do you think that parents 
underestimate the impact of those short little interactions if they feel like they didn't didn't have a long in-depth conversation that it just didn't mean anything. Yes, I really think that's true. I think we so often think about kind of everyday talk as something that fades in the background. So we're sort of on autopilot in terms of let's get there, let's get here. And when I talk to parents about conversations, yes, the biggest thing they think is, you know, have a big conversation about X topic. Uh, We don't often think about kind of harnessing those everyday moments and really thinking about the fact that we can have a really interesting conversation about a rock we found on the ground or, you know, (laughs) something that's on their shirt or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be a profound discussion to bring us closer and to help kids think deeply, too. What is it about those little conversations? How can we do that? How can we harness that? Like, what are some of the things that parents could do that would help with that? Yeah. So I really, in my work, I lay out three main principles, which I think about sort of the ABCs of these more meaningful conversations. Um, The A is just to be adaptive. So that means to really check in with the child's mood, their temperament, kind of how are they? And not just in general, but really at that moment. So taking that chance to see, is this a time when they want to have a longer talk? Is this a time when they, you know, need a little bit of quiet time first? So that A is really important. Um, The B is the back and forth. Uh, So oftentimes I hear parents frustrated because kids say, oh, you're not listening to me. But we often talk kind of at kids. You know, there's a sense of we have an agenda, we want to get it across. And sometimes that's necessary, of course. But other times we could have more of a back and forth when the child, their voice is equally important and we really respond to them. And C is the child driven. So actually thinking about starting with what's on a child's mind, if they're excited about something, if they're worried about something, and even if it seems minor, you know, my son coming back with peanut butter on his shirt, you know, and he really wants to talk about this, you know, you can get a really engaged conversation going simply from something that's really, really minor if the child is interested about it. So following their interests and letting them have that active role in the conversation can be really a big benefit. And one other thing I'd also add is just to realize that kids often, even if they don't have a lot of language, they're thinking about a lot of big things, you know, so they want to understand, you know, what happens after we die or what happens, you know, to this rock when it goes off the mountain, you know, they have a lot of big questions. So taking just a few minutes to think with them about those questions is really important too. I think the expectation for parents has changed a lot since we were growing up um, and what our even our relationship should look like with our kids. So I'm curious, what were the conversations like that your parents had with you when you were growing up? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that we also had a lot of these kind of logistical conversations. They, they definitely ranged as well. Um, but I think we were also really busy. So a lot of times we had a lot of talk about um, where we needed to get to and kind of how quickly we could get things done and things like that. So um, we also had some of the the richer conversations. So I think I I took inspiration from some of the richer ones. And then I also thought about kind of what the challenges were when we do get into that more rushed um, pattern as well. I'm assuming that those experiences, as well as your experiences as a speech pathologist, kind of influenced your work in this area. What what were some of the things that brought you to this work specifically about how parents can communicate with their kids? Yeah, so it's interesting. It's actually, as a parent myself, um, I realized that I knew a lot of the research in communication, but that I actually wasn't using it, almost as if you you were talking before in my own life. Mm -hmm. So I felt that we were actually on autopilot. And I remember talking to my husband at one point um, and saying, you know, well, what did we even talk about this weekend with our kids? Um, mm. And neither of us could really remember. So we just thought, oh, it's, you know, we did a lot of things. We were very busy. But what did we actually talk about? Kind of how did we actually relate um, in conversations? And that struck me as really interesting and also something I felt a lot of other parents probably shared is that these moments kind of slipped by, even though, you know, we could have talked about interesting things, but they didn't feel particularly memorable. And so for me, I wanted to take what I knew about the power of conversation from the research and think about, well, how could we actually make that happen in our lives? What's something specific that stands out to you from the research that you felt like parents perhaps were not implementing or understanding? Uh, I'd say one thing is what we call emotional reminiscing, which is really just talking about the past 
in detailed ways using emotion language and especially talking about coping strategies. So oftentimes I found that we want to protect children. And so if we had something, you know, or they had something bad that happened to them or scary, like they went to the doctor or they, you know, had a, a scary experience with someone, we don't often talk about it. Um, we think, oh, it's better that we just kind of put that under the rug and, you know, they'll forget about it or they'll, you know, it'll sort of fade away. But the research really suggests that we can actually help them um, to improve their mental health, to improve their coping strategies, and just to really support even their experiences of pain, actually. We can shift those by the ways we talk about those past experiences. So kids really do need support in kind of processing those harder experiences rather than just ignoring them and hoping they'll make sense of them. What advice would you have for parents maybe who attempt to have some of those conversations, but perhaps their kids prefer to avoid them or, or back away from those conversations? Yeah, so I would really start in that case with just modeling in your own life, especially talking about things that are, you know, kid appropriate, but that may have been hard for you. It may have been slightly scary for you. Um, and just making that a relaxed but regular part of your daily talk. Uh, I usually really do emphasize not forcing anyone to talk, uh, including kids who don't want to. I think it's conversation really should be something that's free flowing and engaged. Um, but so if a child doesn't want to talk, they can often really benefit just from hearing the way you talk, the way you verbalize and strategize, and even the way you talk about yourself. Um, so really thinking about if something didn't go well, how are you talking about yourself? How are you talking about what you might do next? Um, are you giving yourself compassion? And all of that can be really helpful in helping kids move forward, too. One of the things that can be really helpful is having that level of self-disclosure. I think it also really normalizes a sense of vulnerability a little bit. And so I feel like talking about those things and saying, oh, well, you know, I had this situation happen, but here's how I got through it. Or I think sometimes even just kind of narrating your internal self-talk, like any of those things can be helpful for kids to kind of see how we are handling them. Definitely. Yes. It's funny because I actually had one experience I still really remember with um, mistake making conversations. So my daughter who said, you know, I never make mistakes when she was about four. Um, and her preschool <laughs> teacher said she was losing friends because she would blame everything on other people because she didn't make any mistakes. And so, yes, we had sort of a lecture type conversation about that, about how it wasn't good to, you know, blame other people and all this, but that obviously didn't have much effect. Um, and one day I had the idea that we were just going around the table at dinner and we would all share um, something we did that was a mistake um, and really normalize it. So I love that idea something we did and then also why we thought it happened and how we might change it in the future. So it was really simple things like forgetting an umbrella or pressing the wrong elevator button or something like that. Um, but it really did, I think, normalize that feeling of we're all making mistakes, we're all strategizing, and we can actually support each other. And I think that's a really important shift to make for a lot of families if you are in that mode where kids feel shut down. Mm-hmm. How did your daughter respond to that conversation? It was actually really, really funny because she was pretty adamant that she didn't make mistakes. And it, it was certainly not. So not one of those flip a switch. And, you know, now she she's fine for quite some time. So I'd say several days we did this at dinner and she continued to say that she didn't make mistakes and she didn't have a mistake. She was, you know, she's very persistent. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it was funny. I kind of dropped it a after a while. I just thought, you know. She's not really responding to it. And, you know, why, why force the issue? But actually, the next day at dinner, after I had just stopped doing it, she stopped me and she said, wait, you forgot. You know, you didn't do your mistake. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, I, OK, I forgot. Yeah. And so I did it. And then my husband did one. And she was like, oh, and I have one, too. Uh, and she actually <laughs> she added one. And it actually became for a little while sort of a tradition for all of us to do that. Um, and so she she did actually come around. But it was. A process and it was a few conversations. And I think it also was a matter of her not feeling forced to do so. Right. Yes. Well, it's also interesting, I think, in that particular situation, the time that she finally disclosed her own mistake was the time that she was in control of even initiating the conversation. Exactly. Yes. And I think I also think because she got to remind me, so there was a pattern, I dropped the pattern. And so it's like, oh, you you forgot. So, so was, <laughs> yes, that was her, her reminding me of my other mistake. <laughs> We're keeping tally now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
More in a minute. The Bell and Blank Center is a leader in talent development for students from elementary through university. Their Academy for Twice Exceptionality and their Assessment and Counseling Clinic feature leading psychoeducational assessment, counseling services, resources, and consultation for parents and their children from preschool all the way through college. One of the best options for neurodivergent students is early entrance, and the Buxbaum Early Entrance Academy at Bell & Blank is known around the globe as one of the best options for helping your child get an early head start on their education. Buxbaum enables high school juniors and seniors who are ready for university-level work to skip their final years of high school and head straight to college. The Bell & Blank Center's Academy for Twice Exceptionality helps our neurodivergent college students to foster meaningful academic experiences and develop independence, social-emotional maturity, communication skills, and career readiness. The Bell & Blank Center at bellandblank.org. That's B-E-L-I-N-B-L-A-N-K dot org. Or look for a link in the show notes. I know that one of the obstacles that a lot of parents face when having discussions with their own kids, and and it kind of builds on what we were just talking about, but that they have trouble regulating their own emotions, especially if it's a difficult conversation. So um, another example from my work with my clients is I noticed that it's always much easier for me to have this calm and collected conversation with somebody else's child (laughs) where I'm objective and not involved in the situation, but I have to work a lot harder to both listen and not get frustrated when I'm talking to my own kids. Do you have any ideas about how parents can help to monitor and manage their own emotions to help facilitate difficult discussions? Yes, definitely. And I I definitely agree with that. I think it's so easy just not to recognize how often we're being triggered or sort of why we're being triggered by certain things and just to kind of move forward and maybe only afterward have that sense of, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that or, oh, that was, you know, didn't feel good at the time. So I think the first thing really is just to notice that, just to allow yourself to take that pause in that moment to say, oh, I'm responding in a way that surprises me, you know, that I don't necessarily like, um, that feels out of proportion maybe to the situation. And I think obviously there's mindfulness techniques, like things like breathing or um, stepping away for a minute. But I even emphasize to the some of the parents I work with that you can actually sometimes verbalize some of those emotions to your kids in a way that helps regulate yourself and also helps your children understand kind of how you're processing things. So not to say, oh, I'm you know, so frustrated now I could you know, do whatever, but really just to say, you know, I'm feeling myself you know, tense up a bit. I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated. I think it might be better for me if I just take a break from this and I'll come back in a few minutes or I'm going to go and just make a note for myself because I'm feeling like I need a little bit of quiet before I can come back to this. Um, And that actually helps children as they're trying to figure out and manage that world of emotional regulation. You know, how can I actually strategize and find things that work for me? So I think sometimes that verbalizing, it does bring us more to that rational brain, but it also does support kids in learning the strategies too. You mentioned taking breaks. And I feel like sometimes, sometimes parents feel that their child is being disrespectful if they ask for a break from a difficult conversation. What are your thoughts on that? I think that is really challenging because sometimes, especially if we think something's important, we can get really frustrated or just wound up in the sense that our child doesn't think it's important. So there's a lot of projecting that can happen. But oftentimes a child does really know themselves in that moment, you know, and, and can sense, you know, I'm, I might do something I don't like if I have to continue this conversation. Um, so in a way, it's similar. I, you know, my daughter, for example, is quite introverted, I would say. And so, you know, after a day of school, getting home from the bus, she really wants to go to her room. And it may be to, for 10 minutes and maybe for 20 minutes. You know, she might read. She might look at her iPad. And, you know, for a while I was saying, oh, let's talk. Let's hear about the day. Let's do this. Let's do that. Before realizing that if you do that, you know, you're going to get a conversation that's annoyed, that's frustrated. Uh, because it simply isn't the right time for her. So she recognizes in a way that she needs that decompression time. So I think if you can just simply ask yourself, you know, why might my child be doing this? Is there another reason other than just being disrespectful or not wanting to answer? Um, And maybe there is a better time. So I often think about timing conversations at a time when it works for both the adult and the child. 
Yeah, I think that that's really important to be intentional about that and recognize like when are we having those conversations? And I think also just facilitating them in a way that is thoughtful. It feels like it should be automatic as a parent that we should just know how to do these things, but it doesn't come across that easily. Yes, I think it's it's true. And oftentimes we forget that our kids can be so different from us in terms of their own styles and their temperaments. Uh, I mean, I think a lot about what's called the goodness of fit between the adult temperament and the child temperament. Mm. And sometimes we can really project, you know, my child is trying to do X thing to me. You know, if say you're not a morning person and your child is a morning person (laughs) and they're, you know, talking, talking, talking at seven in the morning, you can feel like, oh, my child's trying to annoy me or my child's trying to um, do whatever. When really it's just this difference in temperaments or in time to wake up. Um, So I do think that as challenging as it can be, I think just a moment of recognizing what that discrepancy might be and then what kind of compromises can you make um, if there are actual strategies. I think those always come out of just first that sense of self-awareness. So obviously a lot of the people in our audience are parents of neurodivergent kids and neurodivergent kids have talked about differences both in personality, but also just in communication styles and needs that are very different than other kids. I know that there are people who listen who sometimes are cautious that some parenting advice isn't necessarily going to work with their kids. So what what considerations or suggestions do you feel like might help parents handle those types of differences? Yes, definitely. So I definitely think that sort of A and the ABC of the adaptive part is really critical um, because obviously you know your child best and sometimes whatever tailored advice you get will never work unless it really does fit your child at that moment. And I even think about kind of the language you use, um, how much you're talking, how what your volume is, even the length of your sentences. So as a speech pathologist, I think a lot about language input and language output. And especially for neurodivergent kids, sometimes they can feel like, oh, this is too much language coming at me, or I'm having trouble expressing myself, or... Um, this isn't the way I would want to express myself, you know, so really recognizing communication differences, both receptively and how much children are understanding and expressively, I think is really important. Yeah. So I've worked with some parents, for example, um, with kids who have had receptive language disorder. So really trouble understanding what they're hearing. Um, and family would say things like, I want you to go upstairs, um, put the clothes in the hanger, clean your room and come downstairs. And the child would have gone upstairs and put one shirt on one hanger and come downstairs. And the parents get really upset because they say, you you didn't follow the instructions at all. You didn't complete even one of those things. Um, But for the child, that was actually a lot to keep in mind. And also what sounds really simple in terms of clean your room really wasn't very concrete for this child. So it actually was like, well, what do I do with that? You know, does it mean put the things in the drawers? Does it mean sweep the floor? So rather than kind of trying to figure that out, the child just became a bit overwhelmed and came downstairs for help. Um, So I think to recognize that, to say, well, what is it about our communication that might be getting in the way of our fluid relationship um, is really important, especially for parents of neurodivergent kids. Yeah, I I feel like we often tell kids what to do, but we forget to tell them how to do it. <laughs> yes. An example of clean your room, right? Or I often think with neurodivergent kids, like executive functioning skills, we say, well, you need to be organized. It's like, well, I don't know how to be organized. And sometimes I think even as an adult, trying to really break that down and figure out what are the steps, it's difficult. But I think when we're trying to communicate with kids, I think sometimes as a clinician, one of my main jobs is I act as a translator <laughs> between parents and kids yes. because there's just this misunderstanding and they think they understand what the other person is thinking, but sometimes they don't. Mm. And if you just kind of break it down and really look at the individual pieces, you'll find that gap somewhere. Yes, I've seen that a lot also. And I've even seen it's so helpful sometimes to have visuals, um, to use visuals as sort of ways of making things concrete. So um, one student was sort of working with, well, how do I make my locker clean? Because, oh, it's supposed to, my locker is supposed to be organized and clean. And it was always a huge disaster. And nobody knew how to, you know, really help this child, um, except by re-explaining things. So actually, you know, we put a picture of, we cleaned the locker, put a picture of the clean locker inside the locker. And so you have a model, actually, of like, this is what the clean locker looks like. <laughs> this is what your locker currently looks like. So in that sense, you can say, well, let's just compare these two. 
Um, and strategies like that it doesn't have to be that, but um, where kids are actually able to take some ownership also and say, oh, I have this concrete picture, um, literally picture of how this should look um, can be really helpful, I think. I did a similar thing one time with a, a client who was struggling with his chore was to load the dishwasher, but he wouldn't put the dishes in in the way that his parents wanted him to do that. And so mm -hmm. that was the suggestion. It's like, well, let's get a photograph and put it on the inside of the cabinet so no one else is going to be able to see it. But those cabinets have to be open when you're unloading anyway. That's great. Societally or, or whatever, we have this expectation that there are things that you should be able to do. But sometimes kids just need accommodations. And there are often really simple accommodations for communicating or whatever it might be. and there's nothing wrong with with accessing those. Exactly. I think that's what's so critical is that oftentimes these also can help kids who aren't neurodivergent as well, which right. I think is also really important. So, you know, who, who does not benefit from having a picture of a clean locker to compare with the non-clean locker, for example, or the dishwasher? Um, I think that can be really helpful. Um, so whether a kid is developing skills and is not quite there yet, or whether, you know, I think that should part um, is the really important thing to work on. Um, because there is so much stigma about, oh, well, my child shouldn't need this, or even kids thinking, mm. oh, I shouldn't need this, and then not taking those steps that are often really simple. I know that social media and technology, too, has had a really big impact on how we communicate as a society. But I think the other thing that really strikes me is how much it impacts kids as far as what they're exposed to and also what they expect from communication. How do you see technology really influencing the communication between parents and kids? Yeah, so I think it can be helpful in time. So I think obviously communication can be facilitated through technology in certain ways, but I do think it can also be a huge challenge to figure out how we cannot do battle over technology, but actually use it to support communication, to support understanding and relating. So I often make a big distinction between kind of active uses of technology and passive um, versus are we actually communicating with someone and, or are we passively scrolling? And then also, is this interactive or is this something that's isolating? So if we're thinking about, well, I have my child playing a video game with all of his friends um, and they're all talking together, relating together while sitting together, you know, that's very different from a child who's on TikTok scrolling through hundreds of images. So I think it's important to take kind of a nuanced view at some level and not just say, well, here's my child using a phone, so that's bad, you know, but actually, well, what is the phone use looking like? Or what is the computer use looking like? And what's kind of the end result? Um, I also think it's very important for kids to become a bit more self-aware about how the technology is making them feel. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I think I see kids who feel so drained or so self-disappointed um, after looking at social media. Um, so helping them kind of take stock a bit and say, well, maybe I I might want to pull back, actually, um, can really help them in becoming more independent with that over the long term. One of the things sometimes that I find can be really helpful that often feels like, again, this might just be a generational thing, but sometimes I think as adults, we feel like maybe communicating through technology is not the same as communicating in person. But I think it can even be a tool that we can use to connect with our kids, too, like especially with some of those introverted or neurodivergent or whatever kids who maybe have a harder time with that face to face conversation. Maybe texting is better for them or there might just be a different way to have some of those meaningful conversations. For sure. I definitely think if we see it as kind of an adjunct to our real life relationships, it doesn't replace them, but we can use it in addition to um, in ways that are enriching. I think it can be really helpful. I think the challenge comes when kind of we feel um, we've lost control over it or children have lost control over it and aren't being self-aware or using it in kind of more autopilot ways. I think really how to help children be more self-aware and think about, well, how is this helping? How is this benefiting us or, or detracting? Um, but I, I definitely agree. I've seen it with my own children as well, that sometimes they're just so excited um, to play a game with me online or to do something you know, play the spelling bee with the New York Times online, we do as a family. I mean, there's so many things you can do that actually are just adjunct to real life, um, but do bring you closer. Yeah. Well, Rebecca, I'm so grateful for your time today. As we wrap up our conversation, I want to ask you one last question. If you were talking to a parent who's feeling especially discouraged about how they are communicating with their child or not communicating with their child, and they're really struggling to improve that connection, 
what's one tip or suggestion you would give? What would be a good place for them to start? Yeah, so I would say really start small. So you can take just say two, five or 10 minute chunks per day um, and think about actually starting with a little bit of silence. So actually it might seem counterintuitive, but just sit beside your child, whatever age they happen to be, um, and watch what they're doing. So are they playing? Are they reading? Are they working on a robot? Um, Just take the time to sit with them and observe them and kind of wonder, either silently or aloud, you know, what is interesting to them about what they're doing. Ask them just a few questions about it. You know, what excites them or what's challenging for them about that? And then just really pull back and let them explain it to you. And if they don't say much, then kind of let that be as well. Um, And actually, that can be a really important opening for a lot of children. Um, Because oftentimes we do spend so much time asking questions and probing. And so actually just having a couple of um, moments of silence and a few questions can be really helpful as a start. Oh, thank you so much. Rebecca Rowland, author of The Art of Talking to Children. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Oh, yes. Thanks so much for having me. Sometimes we all need a chance to think before we respond. This is particularly true for neurodivergent folks, perhaps because their processing speed requires a bit of additional time to work through how they want to respond, or maybe they are trying to avoid responding impulsively without considering their response fully, or perhaps putting their thoughts into words when they're feeling dysregulated just takes a lot of effort. I tend to be a talker, surprise, and I tend to process my thoughts out loud, What this has meant for me as a clinician and a parent, though, is that I have to really try to keep myself in check and give space for the people I'm talking to to respond in a way that is both authentic and unrushed. It's important that I don't try to fill in the blanks and make guesses about what they're thinking, even if I feel like I already know. When we allow other people to have a voice and when we take the time to really listen to that voice, we offer an opportunity to learn self-advocacy and independence that will carry forward to other important areas of life. I'm Emily Kircher-Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thanks again to Rebecca Rowland. Check out her book, The Art of Talking with Children. We'll include a link to it on the episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Also, our new merch store is open for business. I'll give you a heads up. The A Little Weird is Good t-shirt is a hot seller, and it might be the perfect gift for someone you know. There's a link to the swag store in the show notes. This episode has been brought to you by the Bell and Blank Center at the University of Iowa at bellandblank.org with programs and resources to support neurodiverse students and their families. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our production assistant and office manager is Krista Brown. The executive producer and studio engineer, oh, that's, that's me, Dave Morris. For all of us here, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.
This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.